just audio, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, I think we can go ahead. All right, hi everybody. Should we go ahead and start with a um, with a roll call to make sure we have quorum? Yes. All right, Katie, if you could call the roll, that would be great. Yes. Okay. Um, Hakun Abdullahi. Um, Farina Bowler. Here. Mary Christensen. Here. Joey Dobson. Here. Colleen Ebbinger. Here. Jeff Horwich. Queen Kimmins. Brittany Lewis. Brenda Marcos. Uh, Barb McCormick. David McGee. Here. Damaris Mello. Colleen O'Connor Toberman. I think she's in the lobby. Yep. <laughs> uh, I'll come back. Uh, Scott Schaefer. Here. Cecil Smith. Here. Ryan Strack. Here. Rose Tang. Here. Shanae Turner Smith. Here. Amy Wells. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. All right, so seeing as we have a quorum, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. And um, are there any motions to adopt today's agenda? So moved, Ryan Strack. This is Rose, I'll second. Um, what happened to Colleen in the lobby? Um, I tried to let her in, but it didn't work. So here she is again. We'll see, hopefully this works this time. There we go. <laughs> Hi, Colleen. We were having trouble letting you in. <laughs> Glad you're here. My do on my end. Good to be here. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Katie. Could you call the roll on um, the motion to adopt today's agenda, please? Ow. Yes, okay. Um, Hakun Abdullahi. Kareena Bowler. Yes. Mary Christensen. Yes. Joey Dobson. Yes. Colleen Ebbinger. Yes. Uh, Queen Kimmins, did Queen get on the line? Or Brittany Lewis? Um, I know Brenda and Barb could not be here. Uh, David McGee. Yes. Uh, Damaris Mello. Colleen O'Connor Toberman. Yes. Scott Schaefer. Yes. Cecil Smith. Yes. Ryan Strack. Yes. Rose Tang. Yes. Shanae Turner Smith. Yes. Annie Wells. Yes. There are 12 eyes. All right, that motion has passed. And are there any motions to approve the minutes of the last meeting? So moved, this is Scott Schaefer. Thanks, Scott. Any second? Second, this is Colleen Ebbinger. All right, Katie. Good call right. roll, please. Uh, Karina Bowler. Yes. Mary Christensen. Yes. Joey Dobson. Yes. Colleen Ebbinger. Yes. David McGee. Yes. Uh, Colleen O'Connor Toberman. Yes, sorry. 
<laughs> Scott Schaefer. Yes. Cecil Smith. Yes. Ryan Strack. Yes. Rose Tang. Yes. Sinead Turner Smith. Yes. Annie Wells. Yes. There are 12 yeses, so that carries. All right, that might have been record time. I don't know. We're getting the hang of this. <laughs> um, is there, so just as a reminder for anyone who's on the call, uh, for a majority of the meeting, this is a public meeting, but only committee members are able to actively participate in most of the meeting. But this is the time in the meeting when we do have open for public comment. So is there anybody on the line who is here and would like to make a, a comment to the committee at this time? And if so, if you could unmute yourself by pressing star six and let us know your name. Hello, my name is Brother Charles. And I'm on the line. Great. Can you say your name one more time, please? Brother Charles. Great. Thank you. Well, welcome to our committee. Um, and what? Go ahead. You can go ahead with your comment. We budget about a minute per person. So okay. go ahead. I have a comment about uh, why come uh, is it that landlords uh, will have you pay your rent to a pay lease company and then you're paying your rent on time on the first or the third is what they ask you pay it all. But the company that they have that's paid these take some money out of your account when they want to, but then the rental company will try to give you a, a late notice or an addiction because of that, and it's not no fault the tenant, uh, but it's because of the pay these not taking the money out of the account. And why should the tenant be accountable for that? Why shouldn't they uh, renew the lease or let the tenants pay on their own? I want some feedback on that and also about why is it that um, people that are on Section 8 that live in a certain uh, uh, buildings where it's, uh, they tell you that you can sign a lease and then you can uh, uh, go for from one year lease to a six month lease, but then when it's time to renew your lease, um, they tell you that the only way you can renew your lease for a six month lease is that you got to pay a $25 more or more fee to get a six month lease. And you got to put in a written notice of why you wanted to switch to a six month lease. I want to know that and I want some feedback on that. And also about the homeless people that are downtown Minneapolis and downtown everywhere. There's homeless people and they're putting out all these condos and they have no people in the condos, these new residents that they're building, and they have all these homeless people. What are they going to do about the homeless people or the homeless in Minnesota? Not just those that are in shelters, but also those due to the uh, the virus, um, due to losing their jobs and stuff like that. Now they become homeless and people have jobs that now they're making so making it so hard for them that other uh commercial jobs that they have uh they're making it harder for them with tickets and so on and so on to now they can't even pay their own rent and pay their bills why is it that um there's so much stuff going on but there's nothing being addressed to the needs of the people who makes minnesota hello Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted some feedback on that because there's a lot of homelessness out here, but then they're still putting up these new buildings and I mean, they're still going on like if nothing's happening and they don't see this stuff going on in, in the communities and then I, and, and uh, in Minnesota and the counties and the, uh, I mean, it's like it's everywhere now. I mean, it's like and, and everyone's taking advantage of that. Why? Why isn't it that these people are getting help or getting housing? Or why is it that a person who pays their rent, they're trying to put them out because of uh, 
uh, uh, pay these companies that they choose, but then they take the money out when they choose to take it out, even though you have it in your account. So I wanted the feedback on all of that. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, if, yeah. if, 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 is there going to be anything that's going to be any changes for a market rate apartment, market rate apartment, rent apartments are doing this with this Tavis thing, and it's like not any fault to the tenant, but it's due to the thought of the payments company not taking the money out of the account. And then the the landlords are trying to get the tenants for something that what they choose to uh to have that company take the money out, but they take it out whenever they want to take it out. Or mm-hmm. like in the first fall of the weekend, they talk about it takes three to four business days. So then it's past the day that you're supposed to pay it, but it will still come up as paid on that day. But then they want to process you an eviction or a notice. And I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. I think that they should be able to let a tenant pay their rent by choice. If they want to use the pay leave, that's cool. But if they don't, they should be paying by check or money on it. Thank you so much for being here today. I have just introduced myself. My name is Joey Dobson. I'm a lawyer with Legal Aid and I'm a member uh-huh. of this committee. So I just want to say thank you for bringing, you brought up, I think, a lot of really important points about the experience of renters in Minneapolis right now, some of which mm-hmm. are, you know, my just really quick response. Some of the issues you brought up are um, things that are relevant to state law, how kind of how state landlord tenant law works. Mm-hmm. and um, some of the stuff is, is, are things that the city can potentially, you know, you, I know the city right now, one of the things in response to your question about rent increases, one of the things the city is well, doing what are is going to do with the housing situation. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'll just let you know, we're taking notes. I've taken notes and I think others on everything that you've brought up. And I think what you're, the issues you're bringing up are informing what, this committee is really trying to work on of making sure that there is accessible, the affordable housing. The only reason housing. why I say all of that is because the things that are going on, they're already having people in the shelters. And then with the virus out here, now that makes up millions of people losing jobs and making them so uh, homeless. Now with all the stuff you trying to work, and then they make it hard for you to work and you're trying to live in your own apartment, but all your leases and stuff, they tell you you got to do this to do that or there. Uh, give you the vision of something that is not even due to have nothing to do with you. It's because of the uh, situations that they have bought, have a company that's taking out money mm-hmm. uh, your account, your uh, account has some money. So it's like now it's almost like they, they're making everybody homeless. I mean, like, when is it going to stop? Mm-hmm. What are they going to do about this stuff to stop this homelessness? Shouldn't there be some kind of ground, some kind of rule that uh, you know, for them to Joey. even do that or even, you know, I just wanted to know and I wanted to have yeah. some feedback on Joey. this too. Yes, Cecil? So I thank you all so much for listening to me. We're violating our rules here. Yep. So thank you so much for your comments. And we do need to move on to the next portion of our meeting, but we've got, we've taken notes on all of the things that you've brought up today. So thank, okay, thank you well, so much. Uh, thank you. And I appreciate it, and uh, can, have a wonderful there, day. Is there a way that we can reach you, sir, like get back to you? I think rather than just letting you go off the mm-hmm. call like this, us taking this yeah, information. Yeah, on my phone number. Like to, uh, the phone yeah, number. The phone maybe, number that you have, the 612-601-6060. Yeah, okay. okay. So then we can maybe talk additionally offline, Joey and others, to make sure that we don't just let this drop. Thank you for your call, sir. It's been very... We appreciate it. Well, it sounds super you difficult. So much. So. And uh, I appreciate the work that you are doing and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And Great. Joey, we we do have at least one other person um, who's not on the committee on the line. So I'm not sure if they wanted to make public mm-hmm. comment. As well, but. Is there someone else who'd like to comment at this time? This is James Barron. I have no comment. Okay. Thank you. 
And just to make sure one more time, is there anyone else on the line who would like to make a public comment? Okay, hearing none, I think we'll we'll move on to the next part of our agenda and I'll pass it over to Katie for a couple announcements. Thank you, Joey. So I did just wanna um, uh, share a couple of things. Um, I sent an email to everyone, but just wanna make sure you saw we did extend the application deadline um, for uh, the committee um, to the end of this month. I know some folks on the committee have reapplied um, already. And I, um, so if you are still considering it um, and thinking about whether you wanna reapply, um, you do have a little bit more time. Um, that's um, uh, the deadline is now the end of this month. Um, and that's true for all of the advisory boards and commissions across the city that um, they just ended up extending the deadline for all of them. So, um, so just wanted everyone to be aware of that. Um, and then the other announcement I wanted to share um, was that um, I had sent out an email um, uh, or a poll to see if people were interested in doing the housing development 101 um, that Barb McCormick had offered to do, and we didn't get a lot of response to that. Um, and so that's why it ended up not being scheduled. And I guess just kind of wanted to raise it again today to see if there is still interest and, you know, maybe the timing just wasn't quite right uh, last month and if we should try again um, to, to find a time. Um, I'm not quite sure the best way to figure that out in this setting, but um, I guess folks could raise their hand on their uh, on Teams or just if you're on the video or if anybody wants to just kind of speak up um, and we could try again. If I guess the question is, should we try again to get that on the calendar or is sort of the interest in that no longer there? Uh, so I see some hands up. Sounds like so there may still be interest in trying to get this on the calendar. That's how I'm perceiving those hands. Is that right, Scott and others who? OK, <laughs> all right, then we'll send out another. Um, well, I'll work with Barb. She wasn't able to attend today, but I'll work with Barb to find a date that works for her and 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 still try to get that scheduled. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that. Kate. And did you guys did you talk about the extension of the application today? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I was focusing on the on the other piece. Okay. So um so next, you know, we were we've been talking as um so the co-chair and leadership team about the format as we are as we've moved online these last months and how much more challenging it is to interact with each other. Um this platform makes it hard to even see each other's faces at the same time. And so we wanted to start this meeting with just a quick, you know, kind of round robin throughout the group of um, uh, each of us, each of us getting a chance to, to talk briefly, you know, no, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, not real long, but but giving some converse, um, an update about something that we're working on that we're excited about. It could be um, in our professional lives, it could be in our community and, and volunteer lives, it could be in our own personal lives but something related to housing, if that feels like the right thing, if there's something else you wanna talk about, that's okay too. But just an update on what's something you're you're currently work, working on or focusing on that you're really excited about and that you wanna share with the group. And I think it'll be helpful just for us to all, you know, as a group also get a chance to hear about the scope of work that is happening, which may also, um, you know, spark some interest uh, to work together either as a committee or just separately as colleagues um, outside of this committee. So I'll I'll just uh, call on people the best that I can, and I think I um, if I miss you because I can't see you, then um, so I'll I'll make sure to leave some space to let someone else uh, to let people raise their hand that way. But I will start, um, Colleen O'Connor Toberman. I'll start with you, and if you will sure. again, just because sure. it's been a while, let's just remind ourselves names and yeah. or with and and then that question about what we're excited about. Sure. Um, I'm Colleen O'Connor Toberman, and um, one thing I've been really involved in that um, is really interesting is the city's Upper Harbor Terminal Redevelopment, which is the former shipping port on the North Minneapolis Riverfront. Um, I've been involved in that through my professional job, which I don't represent here at the committee, um, but that has been um, a challenging but um, very interesting um, uh, piece of work. Right. Thanks for, for sharing that. 
Um, Scott, I'll have you go next. Um, yeah, and it's just any kind of professional project that we've been working on or what, yeah. Could be professional or personal or community or just something, you know, probably potentially housing related, but if there's something else that moves you to really want to talk about, then that's fine. Um, yeah, so I guess um, through my, yeah, through my job at, um, at MnDOT, um, the Department of Transportation, I've been working on um, some kind of uh, advancing transportation equity initiatives um, that are not uh, housing related, but it's, um, you know, kind of focusing on how we can um, use a more rigorous and, um, yeah, data-rich understanding of the different transportation needs that people have and um, how our policies can uh, serve them better. Great. Thanks, Scott. Cecil. Myself. Yes. So, um, in the last week or two, I have been super excited about Rise Modular's project um, because that is a demonstration project of the way forward. Um, it's one of the first tangible examples of innovation happening uh, in our marketplace around housing um, that we've had uh, in a long time. So. Um, and there's a whole deal flow that's lined up um, in St. Paul with uh, the Ackerberg Group, which is really exciting to hear. And I'm super excited about uh, the grant that Family Housing Fund got from JP Morgan Chase, um, because that is, again, very innovative. And probably Colleen can talk about that because she's probably excited about it too. This is Scott. I, I, ran, by the, I ran by the Rise Modular. Um, it looks beautiful. Yeah, 42nd Hiawatha. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Cecil. Um, great. Rose. <clears throat> Hi, this is uh, Rose and I work at the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers. We're an association of nonprofit uh, community development organizations in the Twin Cities metro area. And it's not exactly housing policy, but I've been working on um, uh, putting together a uh, online conference, a virtual conference for community development association staff across the country. And we're hosting that in two weeks. It was going to be in Minnesota, but obviously we had to move to an online format. And um, our uh, keynote speaker is going to be Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. I'm just talking about, um, you know, the recovery from an equitable recovery uh, from the pandemic and kind of how community development associations, uh, housing developers, what role they have in that um, in that recovery and ensuring that it's equitable. And I'm really excited to, to have the actual event here soon after working on it for, for many months. Thank you. Congrats on that. Uh, pulling off a conference is no small feat and then doing it, moving everything virtual is no small feat, like uh, times two. So good luck with that. Uh, okay, I'm go going through um, in order I see people. Uh, Ryan. Um, hi everyone, Ryan Strack, Minneapolis Schools. And I'll take the, I'll open up the personal option. One, one thing I've been doing during this pandemic is uh, getting into walking a lot more. I find that I have a lot of meetings I don't need to actually be my computer for. So trying to utilize the work from home space and uh, doing a lot of walking meetings. So that's been something kind of fun and interesting. Just changed up a little bit from the computer screen. That's, that's so great, especially because I feel like it takes some sometimes pushing back these days to not have it be a Zoom meeting, but have to have like an old fashioned cell phone call. That's right. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, okay, um, uh, I have to, oh, let's see. The things are moving or as people talk, they move, they, they move around and now I'm getting out of it. Okay, David McGee. Oh, I'm excited. Um, we just we, uh, finished a rental readiness curriculum called Rent Smart, Wise, and Ready. It's a really, uh, I think it's um, very comprehensive, very timely. Um, we're going to start a new cohort 
of families that are going to go through this six hour rental readiness training. Uh, hopefully it gets to a place where there's some type of certification that comes with it. Uh, I think it's going to uh, do well in this season. Excellent. Have to, we should, that'd be, I'd love to get, be interesting for this committee at some point to get more of an update on that. I'd love to hear more on that. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do. Great. Um, again, so uh, Joey, why don't you go next? Sure, again, Joey Dobson, housing policy attorney with Mid Minnesota Legal Aid. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is working with community-based partners um, and renter advocates on thinking about um, potential eviction reform um, legislation at the Capitol in the spring. Um, so we'll see, but I think that we've learned a lot through the pandemic and I think there's a lot of thinking about how, um, how you know, what we might be able to take forward from some of the ways we've thought about evictions during this time. Um, and making sure that you know they're that folks facing eviction have uh, the time they need to have meaningful due process in those cases. So I'm excited to be working with a, a number of community groups on some of those ideas. Great, thanks, Joey. Shania. Hey everyone, Shania. I work at Simpson Housing Services and. I am a part of the Adult Shelter Connect team, making homeless reservations and on, on the evenings and weekends. And something I'm excited about, uh, we just got funding to have a diversion program, and so we'll be bringing on a few new staff. And so I'm hoping uh, we'll have some really great efforts um, diverting, especially like young folks um, and our most vulnerable uh, elderly to various programs that we know are happening um, so that we don't have them in the shelter system. Another thing that I'm excited about uh, at Simpson Housing Services is we've really been leaning into a lot of our anti-racist work. And so I've been a part of creating, um, you know, I was the one who initially proposed it and now it's actually uh, out and about, but we are hiring for a director of an HR. And so that's been really exciting to be a part of that work group um, and screening applicants. And if you know anyone uh, who would fit that role, please send them uh, to the Simpson Housing Services website. Great. Um, thanks for that. And, and so Simpson, Simpson website would be the place to direct people, you said, right? So anyone with good candidates, send them that her way. Uh, Mary Christensen. Um, this is Mary Christensen. I'm a City of Lakes Community Land Trust homeowner, and the Land Trust recently uh, passed the number 400. We've helped more than 400 first-time low-income home buyers into home ownership, um, and that's a real milestone. Um, I personally uh, teach Tai Chi. I've been a practitioner for 40 years. And I want to uh, bring the calmness and stability of Tai Chi to neighborhood people. So I've been teaching uh, free classes on Saturday mornings at eight o'clock in Weber Park. And you're welcome to come and join us. And I find on the street in the neighborhood, there's a really um, welcoming feeling of connection with neighbors on the street as we walk and talk to each other and I'm very encouraged by the sense of community in the, in the neighborhood. Thanks Mary. And Annie. Hi everybody, Annie Wells, they them pronouns. I work at St. Stephen's. Um, I think the update I will do um, is about some restructuring that we did internally at St. Stephen's. Um, as most of you know, the housing and homelessness world tends to have two separate processes for and, and set of programs for single adults experiencing homelessness and families experiencing homelessness. And that's how our programs were set up at St. Stephen's in two different departments with those two different populations. And we changed that um, late this summer and um, 
we didn't merge the programs, but house them under the same uh, department. And so um, we're we're hoping that that will increase consistency and continuity between the programs and also just recognizing that, you know, the frequency that families become singles and singles become families and just hopefully making that whole um, process and system smoother for everybody. Thanks, Annie. And Craner is on the phone. Craner, your Hello. Turn. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I am doing a few things, um, but one of the things that I'm really excited about is I'm partnering with uh, my very own Betty, um, and I'm doing a community drive um, to get items donated. The, the organization, they make the brand new beds, but they do drives for like the bedding, the pillows, lamps and stuff like that. And so far, two of my bins have been full um, from the Finnegan's building. So I've been doing that and organizing that to get kids um, in some beds and uh, putting some smiles on their faces. So I'm excited about that. And then yesterday I met with some uh, residents over at Nicollet and Lawrence Towers. And they having a lot of issues over there. So trying to get them organized with starting their tenant association. Um, their management company is telling them that they can't do it, but I gave them the documents saying that they can. And so we're going to see how that goes. And then I'll connect them with Homeline um, after that. And then I'll see how it goes. But one of the things I'm happy about is the very own bad project. Great. That sounds amazing. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so I'm, I think that's everyone other than me. Uh, so I'm Colleen Ebinger with the Family Housing Fund, and I'm excited, uh, Cecil alluded to this, but we did just uh, win, we were uh, one, of, one of seven um, winners nationally for this uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Advancing Cities competition. Uh, and our proposal was to take advantage of some of the changes to Minneapolis zoning, allowing up to three units per parcel, um, and the cultural corridors that have been uh, identified to try to um, to increase the number of, of low-income households and, and households of color who are owner occupants of uh, two to four unit apartment buildings. So becoming both first-time homeowners, but also property owners, rental property owners, landlords, as both a home ownership or as, as a uh, work to reduce the disparities in home ownership, but also um, so we're working together with Hope Community, Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, the Land Bank, and Minnesota Home Ownership Center um, on that. And so we are just, we started, the announcement was just made and we're just getting that, this kind of starting to get it up and running, but it is um, exciting work. So that's my update. All right. Um, well, good. I, I, um, I hope others found this beneficial. I know it, it took a little time, but I think it's nice to just hear what you all are doing because um, it's just, it's, it's so different in this world of being all virtual and not being able to see each other on the, the table and not having those conversations just before we start the meeting or after the meeting. Um, so it's, it's inspiring to hear the stuff that, um, that you're all working on. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, okay, so then... Next on the agenda, we are going to talk, give an update about the SRO ordinance. Um, so Scott is going to lead us in that discussion. So Scott, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, so I just have, uh, I think I'm only on the agenda for five minutes, um, and I think that'll be about appropriate. So um, yeah, I believe it was, it was Brenda and I who were at um, the um, meeting, virtual meeting, um, with the city of Minneapolis about the SRO single room occupancy um, ordinance. Um, and so it was led by um, council member Gordon, um, council member Schrader and Goodman were there as well. There's a lot of Minneapolis staff and um, as well as um, David Hewitt from Hennepin County um, nonprofits, um, just alphabet soup, right? It was um, AICDC, YWCA, PPL, um, Alliance Housing. So a lot of non profit housing um, developers and um, operators. Um, some of them own and operate SRO properties um, themselves. And so that was a really valuable um, perspective to have. Um, some of the questions that were discussed were um, how we define um, you know, 
this specific type of SRO. And a couple of variables are, you know, is it just a sleeping room where, you know, all the residents share, you know, a set of bathrooms and a kitchen, or um, can it include, uh, you know, a sleeping room and a bathroom, and then they share a kitchen or, um, you know, different permutations. And I think people were more flexible about that. And they thought that it can be any of those things. It can just be anything that, you know, um, yeah, where you don't have the, you know, living room, bathroom, and kitchen all separate, and, you know, for, um, you know, the individual um, residential household. Um, and I guess the other things that we talked about were um, um, just kind of who this is trying to serve, um, and, you know, whether, you know, this is specifically for people like individual um, singles who are, who are, you know, um, experiencing homelessness or whether it could be, you know, for more people, um, you know, older adults on a fixed income or, um, you know, students. I think there's some pushback, especially from the council members um, against having anything that would involve um, students living in SROs. Um, but, um, and then thinking about how physically large, you know, the square footage of each unit. Um, and yeah, I think, can't remember if it's like around 150 square feet, 200 to 300, whereas the, you know, the existing SROs that we have, that the kind of space, um, the, the individual um, unit sizes are around in that range. <clears throat> also talked about, the idea of having some sort of outcome-based um, management scheme where, um, you know, so some of the SROs that are running right now have um, security or a caretaker who lives on a floor and, um, you know, cleans the bathrooms and kitchens once a day and just deciding what level of regulation would be appropriate um, to, you know, not to do something that would, you know, ensure that that all the problems are being addressed and, you know, all livability conditions are being addressed, but also something that wouldn't make it so um, expensive to run or operate that um, no one would want to build them. And so there was floated, someone brought up the idea of, you know, having it be outcome based. So if you have a lot of complaints, then, you know, that operator needs to um, pay for security to you know, take care of the building for some period of time. Um, and yeah, and then there was just about the idea of um, what requirements, what sort of affordability requirements, or, um, you know, how can we keep students from living in them <laughs> um, was, was another um, thing that was brought up. Um, Council Member Gordon was interested in having some sort of rent limit so that maybe wouldn't include an income limit. Um, I think Brenda was interested in having an in income limit to make sure that, you know, the lowest income people um, would be um, served by this. And let's see now. Um, yeah, and then I guess the last thing we talked about was um, the concern that it might cause um, some displacement, the legalization of SROs. Um, if you know, there's a large single family home that has, you know, five or six um, bedrooms. And then the owner decides it would be more profitable to chop it up and turn it into a um, SRO. If, if that would be a, if that would be, you know, something that would cause some displacement and whether there's some sort of safety measures, precautions that we could take to prevent that sort of thing. All right. So that's what I have. Um, does anyone have any questions? And Robin is on the line too. I and Kelly, uh, I think maybe we're both part of that meeting as well. So I'm not sure if you have anything, if either of you have anything to add. Uh, no, I thought that was a great summary, Scott, and just basically really. Um, laid out the complexities right and the the various ways in which we can carve out this uh, new or this revived um, housing choice option so thank you 
I, I agree. I think that was a good summary. Um, I think it was a very helpful meeting to the authors and I, I think probably also to staff just in terms of um, hearing from the, the folks who might who, who are currently offering SRO and, and rooming house options for folks that they would like more flexibility, that, that they think that this is something that um, that that they might actually use. So that's always a, a good thing for us to hear that we're not just like um, pushing on the end of a rope, you know, like the, there's there's somebody who actually wants to do this. Um, and I'll just say, uh, I think it's very helpful that we have assigned a couple of folks from this committee to the work. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to Scott and to Brenda for taking their time uh, and, and joining us. Um, I think, you know, once we've got some some options to look at or once we've got an actual proposal, I think it, it would um, be very welcome to have this committee as a whole um, look at that and, and come up with some recommendations about it. I don't know if that's something that you would want to form some sort of subcommittee about or, or that kind of thing, but I know that that all three of the author's offices would really welcome that. Thanks, Robin. Um, off the top of your head, do you remember the timeline for um, kind of coming up with a, a draft ordinance or the outline of one. You know, I might kick that to to Katie. Um, I don't really have a strong idea. I mean, it's basically like as soon as possible, um, but a lot of people are working on a lot of other stuff right now, and so it's just mostly a question of capacity. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know, Kelly, if you have a sense, but um... I, yeah, I would, I, I guess, agree with Robin's assessment. It's as soon as possible. And this one also, it's a, a lot of the zoning um, staff are involved because it's really a zoning issue. Yeah, uh, it, well, it's zoning and fire code. There's some pretty yep. high barriers, you know, that need to be uh, at least wrestled with. So. Um, so if, if I'm running this um, item, <laughs> um, should I start, uh, Cecil, did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, um, comment and a question. Has the group considered moving away from, you, you mentioned it even in your comments, the alphabet soup, right? And, and using what has been the terminology that's been used in the coastal markets in New York and San Francisco, Los Angeles of co-living, right? So we call this co-living housing rather than SRO, which um, has its own, there, there's cert certain stigmas attached to SRO, or, you know, it's recovery housing and things like that. And and uh, we want people to embrace this form of housing. It's a very uh, climate friendly, um, social cohesion uh, form of housing that uh, has real options. Um, so rebranding and thinking about the terminology that people are using in other markets around co-living housing rather than you know something that's completely meaningless to the general public when you say mm -hmm. SR. Um, so that's one comment and then the question is on, on the student housing piece ha that's extremely difficult to eliminate because as we know college students are very resourceful um, but they don't have a lot of money and they figure out options for housing and will will even lie about their student status to be able to get access to uh, affordable housing because that's that's the only thing you're discriminating against is their student status um, and that's that's usually a self-declared status um, so I'm just that that strikes me as a real conundrum if you want that not to be available to students because I think students will will work around the system so Cecil, I think I can speak to both of those. Um, to your first uh, comment, um, I, I think that people generally agree. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is like, what's the difference between an SRO and a rooming house and does it matter? Um, and so as we're as we're thinking about these categories, we may very well collapse them down into something into something else that that has a different name. Um, and and you're right, that has a name that might have a little bit less baggage and might um, excite people more than it scares them. Uh, on the student question, I don't think it's a it's a. Um, from our perspective, it's not a question of trying to keep students out of this housing. 
it's a question of trying to prevent some of the folks who build just for the student market from from using this inappropriately to build something that's not intended to be affordable that's intended to be pretty expensive and make them a lot of money um, by by packing students in, in in a way that they're the only folks who would live that way and so that's one of the reasons that we're thinking about um tying it to some kind of affordability uh, is to address that and and frankly you know if if a if a student gets into a building that has been built with affordable rents. I don't think that we actually dislike that or, or care about that in any way. It's mostly just to prevent people from building like giant McNorm things and calling them SROs or whatever the terminology is we're going to use in Southeast Como, uh, where it's not providing people with affordable housing. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, Joey, you had your hand up virtually. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, two, just two comments I would make, and I know we're a little over time, but I think we're we're fine on our agenda. The first is um, just more process wise, and Robin mentioned this too. I think this is a really good example of one of the ways that our committee can collaborate and function with the city is having these sort of when it makes sense having designated members be sort of our committee's representative voice or ears. Um, for some of these initiatives. So I just wanted to note that, that this is, I think, a, a productive way to um, kind of do this work with, with the city and bring it back here. And then when it makes sense to do a more full committee, you know, review of, of a thing. So I just wanted to echo the thanks to Scott and Brenda for serving in that role and just think that this is a model that we might want to keep, you know, keep in mind as other initiatives come up. Um, so thanks. My other thought is or comment, and I know we'll have time to get into the details, you know, further. Um, but from my perspective at Legal Aid, you know, we've seen we unfor you know, we see things when they go wrong, right? Typically. So I'm gonna and acknowledge that that that's the perspective that we see based on what we do. Um, but I do think it's really important to be thinking about how, um, you know, rooming houses or similar types of housing in the past have been really damage, uh, damaging to people who um, don't have any options, right? They can be a, a source or a, a way for um, people to really get taken advantage of. And so, and I know, you know, Kelly, I'm sure is thinking about this from a licensing standpoint, but I, I just think that piece is really key to um, be especially if the if we're trying to make this housing available to folks who you know have lower incomes or might not have other housing options and this is their option that we you know are being extra thoughtful that that doesn't become a place that's ripe for a kind of abuse so I just mm -hmm. wanted to flag that from you know the legal aid side that's how we've seen these play out is really hurting people and even um, things like kind of scouting out potential rumors from homeless shelters or from you know people exiting prison or things like that so i just wanted to name that and and hope that that's being considered i'm sure it is being considered but something that i'll be interested in talking about more as the proposal develops so one of the things really that comes up over and over again is if you're a good proprietor, you know, if you're a real responsible proprietor, whether it's a rooming house or a group home or a regular rental property or a short term rental, we, you know, really a lot of the time really has to, I mean, then we don't have problems, right? But if you're a negligent property owner or, or somehow predatory, then there's an issue. And you know we're hoping that the vast majority of folks who get into this type of housing are going to be great responsible folks but you know joey you and i know that is not always clearly not always the case or we wouldn't be here necessarily and you know having these conversations over and over again so but that is always going to be our, our issue how do we support and incentivize the proper um and responsible and dignified operation of of any type of housing Thanks. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I'll uh, pass it back to Jared. Great. 
Seeing none, I think we will move on to the next item and, and Rose is going to lead us in a discussion about the budget, the new uh, mayor's budget proposal. Can you hear me? Yep, I okay. can hear you, Rose. And thanks, Thank you Scott. so much. Um, okay, I am going to try to share my screen. I just have a little PowerPoint presentation. Um, I and yeah. sorry to interrupt you, Rose. This is Katie. For uh, for folks on the phone, um, the PowerPoint is um, linked in the agenda as well. Great. I'm just going to try this and see if it works because there's something going on at the top of my computer. Oopsies. Oh, okay. Is it working? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can't even. Is it? Ah. Where's your shared window? Sharing is paused until you return to the shared window. What does that mean? Do you want me to do it, Rose? Do you want me to share it? Is that easier? Uh, sure. <laughs> I thought I could do this, but I don't know. Me? Okay. Rose, I think I'm seeing your presentation now. From you. Okay. Okay. Can you see this? What does it look like? What does it say? The, I, we see the PowerPoint like not in presentation mode, but like with the, I think we see your screen 2021 budget. Okay. With, like the PowerPoint options and stuff. Okay. Uh, great. Can we just do it like this then? I think when I, oh wait, I figured it out. I'm, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Does that work? Perfect. Okay. There's a, okay. Great. So, um, and I guess, so I can't see anybody when I'm doing this. I can only see the slideshow myself. So just to, just to let you know, um, I'll do the, I guess I'll just do the whole slideshow and then, and then I'll close it. So, um, and just, I guess to start off with, you know, I think last year we had somebody, you know, who was involved in the budget making process share a little bit about the 2020 budget. And obviously I don't work for the city and was not part of making this budget. So um, I'm coming at it more, you know, from an outside perspective as kind of a housing advocate. And I know there are people on this call who are, who have had a closer um have been involved in this budget process. So if anybody wants to interrupt at any time, if I've gotten something wrong or um, if you know you have other information that you think the committee would um, like to hear, I think I'd just be just, you know, kind of as a disclaimer, I'm totally open to that and just want people to, to know that. But um, I guess from my perspective, uh, working at MCCD, the budget is something that we kind of pay attention to every year, particularly as it relates to resources for um, affordable housing development because our members do, um, that's what, what the majority of our members do is build affordable housing. Um, so, um, so everything that I have listed on this presentation is just um, what has, is publicly available um, when you want to kind of look into what is proposed for, for the budget. So got these all off of the uh, 2021 budget website, but um, I think our or, you know, my original thought process here was just to kind of highlight some of the changes uh, that are in the budget for housing. Um, and at the end, there's kind of like a resource for where you can find all of these links too. So um, I think, you know, we've talked uh, for people who have you know, been following kind of the budget. There was a like a revision for the budget for the 2020 budget earlier this year. I think everybody um, is aware that COVID had, has had kind of a negative impact on um, on the city's uh, financial status, I guess. Um, hopefully I'm not saying that into uh, in an offensive way, um, but so there are some, I think, uh, budget reduction targets for all of the departments um, for community planning and economic development, CPED, where a lot of the housing resources come from. It looks like a 7% uh, reduction with, um, and you know, the numbers 
the numbers are here. So um, 2.37 million in personnel costs, 637,000 in discretionary spending, it's cutting the 4D uh, budget by a little bit. Um, and then there are also some, some changes uh, additions, I guess, um, for some of these different programs too. So um, adding a million dollars in ongoing investment to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund program, which is where a lot of the uh, multifamily rental housing is built, uh, two million in ongoing investment to Minneapolis homes, which is where a lot of the homeownership funding comes from, uh, two million for the naturally occurring affordable housing preservation. Uh, the Stable Home, Stable Schools program is being made into a permanent program. I think from shifting from a from a pilot program and um, some additional funding for tenant resources. And here is just kind of a, 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 a picture of the, the actual kind of uh, numbers that go along with those changes. You can see uh, on the left-hand side, there's a 2019 adopted budget and some of the numbers there, the 2020 adopted budget, and then that third column is the mayor's recommendation for 2021. And then the other columns I believe are, you know, where that funding is coming from, what the specific sources are, whether it's general fund or other, you know, programs that, um, or other programs. So um, the the ones that, you know, we usually pay attention to are just here in this affordable housing, this third box. And um, that's where the, you know, the trust fund and some of the other programs are. Um, and then here are the uh, homeownership program um, items as well. Um, and then uh, the other, I think, area that, you know, we pay attention to is in regulatory services, and it looks like a $1.6 million budget reduction for regulatory services. These quotes here are just from the... Um, from the from the budget document itself there's you know a narrative section which kind of discusses the change items and then just kind of uh, a, uh over overview for each budget i mean for each department and this is what was um i thought was interesting that was highlighted here is um kind of just this um this line here that the at the staffing level, the department would have limited ability for proactive enforcement and would shift to routine and urgent work. And specifically as it relates to housing inspections, that this is at a time when we will experience an increase in renter complaints due to new expectations around MPHA properties. And these impacts will increase greatly if filled positions are cut as detailed in the alternative approaches. So just something to highlight there. A little bit about the budget calendar. Um, the mayor's budget address was in August, and right now we're in this um, October, st just starting this October 8th through November 5th, where each department kind of gives a detailed budget presentation. The two that I wanted to highlight here are the CPED um, presentation and the regulatory services presentation um, later this month, and then also the public hearings. Um, process. So it looks like there is a public hearing um, during the day on the 16th uh, where, you know, anybody can come and give their thoughts on, on the budget. I, um, you know, short comments, like two minutes, I think. And then based on those comments or other things, I guess, uh, city council members will have the ability to, to make changes to this proposed budget on December 3rd. And then on the 9th, there'll be one last public meeting and um, a vote on the budget. So um, for our committee, I think the questions that we have here are just how does our committee want to engage in this process and um, are there any areas that we would like to comment on? What are our priorities and do you feel like they're reflected in this budget as it's proposed? Do you think that anything is missing or um, maybe undervalued? Are there any things that you want to support in the budget to make sure that it doesn't it doesn't change as as the budget kind of goes through this this process of being amended or or uh, changed. And then, if there are items that we feel like we want to comment on, just some different options for for providing comments and um, different ways that we can engage. And just curious how um, 
committee members, what level of engagement committee members want to, to take on. Is everybody still there? Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Joey, Colleen, Katie, do we want to get into the discussion right now or are we, is Council Member Gordon here? I am here. Oh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rose, so much for, for taking the time to present that. And I'll just note that in the chat, um, Andrea from the mayor's office just noted that there's another mm -hmm. public hearing on December 2nd at 6 p.m. prior to the budget markup number one meeting. So I just wanted to voice that from the chat. And so I think for our committee plan, we're um, grateful to have Council Member Gordon here with us today. And we're going to hear from him. And then we're going to, I think, get into a kind of a discussion about um, the budget and, and the questions that Rose just brought up. So thank you so much, council member, for being here. My pleasure. Glad to be here. I just um, welcome the opportunity to stop by. I mostly wanted to just thank everybody for their um, work. Um, things are um, pretty different at City Hall than when we started the Housing Advisory Committee. I was chairing the Housing Committee then. And um, while this idea didn't really originate with me because it actually grew out of another advisory committee, the Public Health Advisory Committee, but I certainly was a champion and I consider this committee one of the key pieces of infrastructure we have at the city to help us get our policies right. And as you are all well aware, we are um, still facing a housing crisis in our city and there's actually lots of policy that's moving through the council um, and i want to first of all just really thank um, committee members for working on the sro or the um, sleeping room or the rooming house ordinance amendments that we're making that's moving along we've made um, some progress in terms of meeting and collecting thoughts and gathering that and i'm hoping to bring something forward um, and hoping to have your um, insights help shape that by the end of the year. Um, I also wanted to make sure that folks were aware that we're working on the emergency shelter ordinance as well. Whereas um, with that SRO, I came to you as we were starting on that, but this is something that we've had some of the shelter providers come and talk to us about because we fixed the ordinance, we thought, or we improved it or whatever, tweaked it a while ago to allow emergency shelters um, more places. Um, if you know the history, for a long time the city required them to be linked to a place of religious assembly. Well, we uncoupled that and we also allowed them in more places in the city, including um, residential areas, um, but we limited the number who could be there. And we're getting, um, things are coming up more frequently now about emergency shelters and it doesn't work if the numbers are limited so low. So we're looking at expanding the numbers, maybe in some of the um, zoning districts having no limit on the number of people that could live there, but also focusing in on residential areas especially. I'll just call out an example that made this glaringly clear when they, um, there was a proposal to use the Gordon Center as a shelter. And um, this is a large old school building that's quite big, but it happened to be in a residential zoning district. So one of the things we're working on is maybe when it's in a residential district, we look at the building and the size of it and we have some flexibility built in there um, so that it could kind of match with that. So that's something to pay attention to and maybe you got too much detail, but I think sometimes a little detail will get you more excited um, and you might want to engage more. So. I was trying to offer um, some of that. Another thing that's coming up, um, of course, I wanted to come up by the end of the year. Um, I'm worried we won't really take action till next year that you've probably heard about is a tenant opportunity to purchase. So this is something that we're trying to build on this advance notice of sale for rental property um, and so that we can have a tenant opportunity to purchase. You should pay attention because we're actually having a um, report back to the committee the results of a study and some recommendations that will be coming forward soon. My understanding is um, as often happens when it's consultants or city staff making recommendations they're going to come in with a pretty big budget um, ask because they think it's going to take a lot of staff to implement it. So if you're talking about the budget you might want to pay attention to that and see what makes sense and how we move forward on that. Um, and th I, there's another thing that I think is coming up early next year which is kind of a right to um, representation um, for tenants um, 
and I think I'm, I think I've named that correctly, but um, for legal representation, um, hopefully you're paying attention to that too. Um, so I just want to um, thank you for all that you're doing and also um, let you know you're um, anybody individually or you as a group are welcome to reach out to me and probably other council offices too about initiatives you have that you're interested in or ideas you have for how we could set better policy. I think that's what I got for you today. I'm happy to talk longer or take any questions too. Great, thank you so much council member for all your work on those important projects and for taking the time with us today. You kind of touched on this with um, noting that, you know, the, your open door and we've had a few of our committee members participate in the, in the single room occupancy conversations. Do you have any other feedback for us or um, comments on how best we can engage with the council and what is most helpful for you? Is it mostly, you know, having we really appreciate things being brought here and having the opportunity to comment but if you have any other comments on how we can be most helpful for the city welcome that so a lot of it is probably about timing so there's um lots of times in the course of some policy decision or some idea um where it's going to be hard for policymakers to even take it on because it isn't necessarily touching them. So the, the 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 piece about the timing, and of course, if it's something that isn't even initiated yet at the council, that's a different, you've got to get somebody to pay attention anyway. But where the biggest impact can happen is um, the steps along the way where things are being shaped and where there's an actual decision point. So if you want to reach out to council members, try to do it close to the time it's coming to a committee um, and it's going to be decided on. And that's when our attention will be um, on that kind of issue. So that's, it's good you, you're looking at the budget now and you're thinking about that because um, that's definitely a big thing that's coming up soon, but that would be one recommendation. And aside from that though, it doesn't hurt to build relationships just along the way and schedule some kind of check-ins. And especially if you, um, um, well, you do, uh, all of you do live somewhere in the city, but um, to think about who, uh, where you live and who your council member is for that area. And I, I, I presumably you want to be a little bit of a voice for the folks in your area and build a relationship with that council member. Can't hurt at all just to do a check in. And a lot of times, um, especially if it's a constituent, especially if a constituent who's volunteering on an advisory committee, we'll want to take a meeting and we'll want to build that relationship so we have a good and healthy working relationship too. So those are two ideas. Thank you. Do other committee members have questions for the council member or, or comments to bring up right now? Cecil, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned, uh, thank you for being here, Council Member Gordon. Um, you mentioned TOPA. Um, have you, can you give any indication of the scope of TOPA? Are we thinking single family on up or are we focused on a particular size of multifamily? So I haven't gotten my preview briefing. Um, so, um, okay. you know, I'm, I'm, you know me, I'm, I'd like to see it pretty wide open and have lots of opportunities and options, um, but um, I don't know, because we did certainly have some discussions early on about Washington DC's model and those other things. I, Katie might have more of a preview of the study than I have, but she might want to keep all that information <laughs> waiting <laughs> until the consultants actually put it forward. I don't know what the thinking is. We certainly, the council members who have been working on this have talked about where do we where do we start and how far down does it go? Um, so that has been an issue we've talked about. I can, I mean, just briefly, I can add, I mean, I think there's still details being sorted out and and obviously, you know, meetings that'll be happening with council members and stakeholders and others. So I, I, mean, I think like obviously nothing decided, but the, the consultants have been looking at. So what the report will include is sort of a range of policy options that the city could consider. And single family is something that they're looking at is at least something that the they're looking at how single family could work in, in Minneapolis. But there will be need, there will need to be policy decisions made around around all of that. Well, and presumably budgetary ones too, because it's 
not very cheap in Washington, D.C. to run the program. So maybe I can give just a little bit um, more of an answer for you, Cecil. Um, I think there's a lot of interest, especially from the North Side Council members, where a, where a large percentage of the housing stock, especially the affordable housing stock, is single family homes. Mm -hmm. uh, in getting to the point where this would apply to single family homes as well. Understanding that um, there's a there's a pretty big difference between somebody who owns 200 single family homes and somebody who owns one uh, as a rental um, and and where that line is between somebody who is operating a business that is tens or dozens of, of single family homes that they're renting out and somebody who literally owns one place that they're renting um, uh, is a thing that I think we'll be we'll be considering and how we draw that line and then uh, acknowledging that we don't necessarily have a very good way of tracking uh, ownership across all of the different buildings right now. So um, we might have to build that and it might take a little bit longer than for the rest of the building stock. So if there aren't questions, could I just say one more thing? Um, at our last committee where we took up housing issues, which is now the um, Business Inspections and Z Housing and Zoning Committee, I think we're calling it. Um, we had a couple really nice things move forward. I think critical things, maybe nice is the wrong word, but positive steps. We approved um, funding for a tiny uh, village uh, that would potentially um, provide shelter this winter for um, 100 people. Um, you, maybe you heard about this, but this is pretty groundbreaking. There's lots of um, um, philanthropy money that's come into this, but we also are using some of our money to pay for operations of it, which is significant. There's been a bit of a wrestling match here in the policymakers whether we should ever invest city money in operations, and we've now moved that quite far recently, and this is going to make this possible because there's other sources that um, we're hoping will allow them to do their tiny home village, and they even have a warehouse site um, where it's going to be inside. You've probably heard of that. We also approved another shelter that could open in December um, that will be in some buildings. The Cedar Box Company used to be called. It's right near where the Navigation Center was a few years ago, but this will be a, a much better kind of an, um, emergency shelter because there'll be bathrooms and facilities and, and eating areas right inside of a building and it will all be sheltered. So those are two significant things that we had to change our policies about a little bit and we had to change um, the way we fund things and um, the committees moved them forward but you, you still have a chance to tell council members if you think they're a good idea before um, a week from Friday when the whole council is going to decide on them and they'll become more of a reality but I just wanted to let you know about that I see that as um, pretty good steps for us to be taking right now that took a lot of work to get here from a lot of different people. Thank you so much. And just one more check. Is there any other, are there any other questions from committee members? Um, yes. yes, this is Karina. Go ahead. Um, hello, Council Gordon. Thank you for being here. Hi, glad to be here. Glad you're here too. Yes. yes. Um, I have a question. Um, do you know if there's any like real solid plans that you might be aware of? Well, we um, can hear, you know, more permanent housing for the unsheltered that can be um, out there. Maybe it's in conversation, but like if there's anything solid um, for permanent housing um, or supportive, you know, housing for the unsheltered. Well, that usually comes up on a project by project basis, and there definitely um, are. I'm just um, so. Katie probably knows the next projects that have just gotten some funding. There's even some funding that came from the Met Council. Um, so uh, there's nothing. Um, I mean, there's some that have been being built and they'll be opening soon too and, and others. But um, Katie, you want to wait? Sure, I can comment on that. So there are, you know, a couple that either just opened or, or are imminently opening. One is Park 7. Another is Mino BD, I can't pronounce it, Mino BD Win, Mino B, we call it for short, um, which is also near where the Navigation Center was, um, across from where the um, 
uh, the new um, homeward bound AICDC project for shelter will be. There are 110 units of permanent affordable um, supportive housing for people who've experienced homelessness that are opening, um, I think, projected to open by the end of the year. Um, and then um, the uh, city put out a request for proposal in the spring for um, the affordable housing trust fund dollars that we award to help build permanent supportive housing. And so we will be announcing the funding recommendations for those or bringing the re bringing the recommendations to council um, by the end of the year. Um, and so that will be more uh, creation of more permanent supportive housing with city dollars. Um, and then just generally speaking, I mean, every we know that um, by February of next year, from from sort of the range of this summer to February of next year, there were going to be 220 new units of permanent supportive housing closing on financing um, and and a number opening. Um, so there are given the increased investments that the council and mayor have made over these last couple of years, we are now starting to see those units come online. Um, of course, it takes usually a couple of years from when we award the money to when the units can open, but because this has been happening now for several years, we're starting to see those units come open. Um, so I could certainly work on a more comprehensive list, but I can just say, you know, those two developments that I mentioned have are opening now, and I know there are more that will open over the next couple of months. Um, and then, as Councilmember Gordon mentioned, there are you know these new shelter proposals opening. Um, there's also Envision Community that um, we're still working with, um, which is permanent housing but tiny homes that we're still working with them proactively to try to find some um, sites. Um, so there are a number of things happening, um, sort of trying to we're trying to make sure there are a range of um, both shelter and then permanent housing options that we're working toward um, coming mm -hmm. coming together. Okay, cool. And then how will um, how will they know? How will they hear about it? Those that are looking, you know, to be housed. How will they get the word? How would the word get out to the public about um, the permanent housing buildings that are available? Um, for them to occupy? How would they, how would the word get out? So, um, and I might actually ask Annie or Shania to comment on this as well. I mean, the units that are permanent supportive housing and dedicated for, you know, people who've been experiencing homelessness are, are typically filled through the coordinated entry system with Hennepin County. So often people are hearing about it through, um, through connections that way. I think the other resource that is probably important for everyone to be aware of if you're helping people look for housing is Housing Link. Um, so any project that the city funds, we require that the vacancies be posted on Housing Link. So it's housinglink.org. Um, and there, Housing Link's a nonprofit organization that um, keeps a list of all, of affordable rental housing availability open. So a lot of caseworkers work with it, but individuals can work with it as well. And it has both, you know, units that were funded with government assistance and and units that weren't. So just private landlords putting their um, units on housing link. Um, and so I would say those are kind of the two, um, the two paths for people to find would be housing link and then also, um, you know, working with a, a housing provider through the coordinated entry system. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. I think maybe, uh, Robin, is your hand up from before? Just making sure, or did you have something else you wanted to add in here, Robin? Yes, it was up from before. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no problem. So I think we might um, kind of move on to the rest of our discussion. Obviously, council member, you're welcome to stay or or welcome to to move on to your next thing either way. But thank you so much for for being here. You're so welcome. Thank you all for all the good work you do. Take care. All right, Katie, same question. Are you, is your hands? Did you have something specific? Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll pass it maybe back to Colleen and Rose to move to this next part and maybe 
Colleen, if you want to give a little update about the, the report, kind of explain the two things we're talking about now. Unmute myself. Yeah, so we are, you, know, you may recall that last year we had a report to, um, wait, sorry, this is, this, this is the report as part of our committee report we're talking about, or, right? Yeah, so I think we were going to kind of just right. 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 talk through the budget, you know, any feedback we have for the budget, and then also know that we're going to be making that report to the committee and that we'll include in that. Yeah, I just want to make sure I wasn't confusing with the other. Okay, so the so you may recall that last spring we worked through a report to the housing or to the the council to the co council committee um, about to kind of give an update on the work that we had done as a committee in our first year. We never actually made that um, commit that live report. So I think we did submit it um, virtual or you know by email, but we never actually presented it because. Um, because then the pandemic hit at the meeting that we were to uh, present it to. So, um, but but we're coming up on kind of the end of another of this full year and wanted to provide that report and start talking about providing that report to the to the council committee. Um, but in part, part of that would be a comment on the budget and what sort of recommendations this committee may want to have. So, um, you know, we started this conversation with Rose giving kind of a general overview of what the budget is looking like as proposed for 2021. And so this would be our opportunity to talk through it more, um, it, think about what sort of comments we want to make as a committee. Um, it's in the right direction. We would like to see more of this, less of that, that sort of thing. And then we can incorporate that into a report to the, the council. So, I think for just a, start, just a beginning conversation, given what we've heard so far, does anyone have comments about the, the currently proposed budget for city budget for 2021? Uh, I see Ryan has his hand up. Go ahead, Ryan. Thanks. I will never pass a chance to, to speak about stable homes, stable schools. Um, I don't know how much in detail we've talked about the program but it is one from my perspective, which is from a student and school perspective has made a, a pretty massive difference. And I, I, I'm glad to see it proposed as a permanent program. And I hope that the committee will consider um, flagging that as, as something we support in particular. It has um, particularly unique program design in that it has two kind of paths. One is an eviction prevention, a housing stability side. So it's able to respond there prior to someone losing their housing, but also has a rental assistance component with this wraparound um, partnership. It's a jurisdictional partners are the city, the county, and the school district, but then there is a contracted nonprofit partner, the Y. Um, and then I, sorry, neglected the MPHA, but the Y does the services in partnership with the school social workers. And so it's this really unique two generation uh, um, program, which is serving both uh, adults and allowing them to figure out um, how both housing as well as employment and other things, and also then stabilizing the student at their school and giving them that uh, support that they need. And so it has, we just, it's great timing. We just had a, a committee, a steering committee update yesterday on the program, and we were able to hear from two moms who shared the impact the programs made for them. But as of uh, end of September, it served uh, 2,300 children already, and it, that's out of 801 families. So um, just trying to put it out into the space that it has been a, a really great innovative program that I think is um, fully ready to move into a permanent status. So I uh, would appreciate the committee uh, noting that if, if possible. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. And I'm just going to jump uh, in right here really quick. I think I might, I'm going to take some notes on this and share my screen so that we're seeing some of these comments. Um, you know, we don't have Kelly's magic sticky wall, but to kind of best replicate that just so that we can be kind of seeing some of these ideas on the virtual page. Um, and the way I have it divided is um, specific comments on the budget and then 
as we're talking if other feedback to the city that we want to include in our report of things that we want the city to be prioritizing um, in 2021, there'll be a space for that too. So I just thought I would note that and then we can yeah move on. Thanks for letting me jump in. Thanks for doing that, Joy. Colleen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Colleen O'Connor Toberman. Um, Ryan, thanks for your comments. I noticed in Rose's presentation that it seemed like the amount uh, being allocated to the program is changing. Um, do you have any feedback on sort of what, you know, what it should be at for a permanent level or, or what it would take to meet the demand? Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, I don't know if Andrea or anyone else wants to jump in, but I think the basic premise is kind of a it speaks to the success of the program. So it has, um, while some of the city funding uh, contribution is, is reducing, there's actually been a receipt of a large state grant for the program, as well as some uh, phil philanthropic dollars that have um, come, in, come into play so that it can maintain its service level. I do think one element that I know both the council and, and the mayor's office were um, wanted to be really clear about was that this wasn't a panacea program and we have um, the in the kind of rental assistance program obviously depends quite heavily on available units which is not something we we have an awful lot of in the city and so uh, you know Andrew might have a better comment I think the general um, level feels like a good place to be for now based on how um, especially with size of units I think has been something that we've we thought may be an issue, but a lot of families with four or five or six children, and we're trying to find quite large units. So I don't know if Andrew wants to add anything, but I, I think the general sense is that the way the funding looks on the city spreadsheet may not be indicative of the commitment to the program because it has these all these other funding sources, but that the service level is slated to continue at it at its current level. I am happy to jump in and give a little bit of detail on that. Um, so the where we arrived at the 2.2 million was based, as Ryan was saying, on um, what what we found through the last year and a half of with our um, staff capacity at all the different entities, um, as well as the housing market, um, how quickly we're able to get families um, through the program and, and into housing. So we have structured this to look like being able to continue at the same pace, which is a pace that we feel like is moving um, as fast as we can, given the sort of restrictions of the of the market in particular. Um, and one other piece, though, that I would note is that um, it looks kind of um, it does look like a reduction because of the way that the budget book works, but because it was a pilot program for only three years and we were, but we were making three year commitments to families on the rental assistance side, we were essentially planning for six up to six years worth of services. Um, so because some families would enter in year three and have a three year commitment with a three year funding period. So by making it permanent, um, we no longer have that mismatch between the service timeline and the funding timeline. So um, that sort of also al kind of explains why it looks like it's a reduction, but we're able to keep the same amount of services. Um, and then the third thing I would just add is, um, Ryan's right, we did just um, receive a homework start with home grant um, for the next three years. And um, that funding is actually going to increase the amount of services that families are eligible for. So on the rental assistance side, we've been able to provide really robust wraparound services um, through the existing um, partnership with the Y. Through this Homework Starts with Home grant, we're able to add capacity at both MPS and at MPHA um, to um, at MPS continue and expand the partnership between housing and, and school time. So to make sure that that connection um, and the success that we're having on housing um, can really translate into success um, on their school lives as well. Um, and then the MPHA staff is gonna help us be able to provide deeper services to the families who are getting that one-time emergency assistance funding so that they'll be able to access um, some additional um, services to help them with whatever um, referrals they might need for other kinds of services and things like um, um, connecting to budgeting and um, workforce training and things like that. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Anyone else have a comment 
on the budget. And I, I think I, I, I think I can't see, I, I'm not sure that I can see everyone whose hand might be raised because of the share screen. So if I'm not, so go ahead and just talk if you have something, if I'm not calling on you. No other comments I'm not hearing. This is Kalina O'Connor, our Tom run again. The only thing I'll say is that I feel like it's a little bit, you know, in, in a year where there are budget reductions citywide and it's not an easy budget year, um, it just feels tough to make informed comments without sort of understanding where else in the city reductions are coming from. Um, I know some of that has been kind of shared with the committee over time, but um, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that the committee has time to dig into all that, but I think it does make it a little bit challenging to feel um, within the scope of this conversation, like we can fully comment on priorities. Yep. Yep, I can hear that. Um, okay. What about, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. And I, I can't tell who that is talking. So just, it's Rose. And I just had okay. a question, you know, we haven't talked much about affordable home, home ownership in, in our last couple of, I guess, you know, through our time on this committee. And I did just notice, you know, and maybe this is a question for, for Katie, I'm not really sure, but um, in 2019, the budget for Minneapolis homes looks like it was a little over 5 million. And right now in 2021, um, it's, I think, proposed at 2.75 million. And I don't know if, I think maybe, you know, David or Mary, if they have any comments on on that, or um, Katie, just in terms of like what our ability is to kind of, um, you know, make an impact in that home ownership space with that level of funding. I know, um, you know, just in terms of home ownership being being a source of wealth creation, and um, given kind of our uh, racial home ownership gap that that we see in the city and the state, if that is, um, I guess, a, a concern or not. Um, I can just maybe comment on the, like, the amount, and Andrea, feel free to um, also comment if, in terms of the budget. So the, the amounts from the past, from last year, so the difference is that it was one-time funding and this, the proposed funding this year is ongoing funding. It's in its base funding, um, so um, so that's actually you know that means that it it will be in the budget again next year unless there are base reductions. So it's more it's similar to stable home stable schools where it was one time funding that's now being proposed to turn into an ongoing program. Um, so that's just I'm not really trying to comment one way or the other on. Uh, on your question other than to just share that that background information. Andrea, do you have any, is, I'm getting that right, correct? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll just answer sort of generally sort of to both questions. Um, I think one of the things, uh, well, I know that one of the things that the mayor really wanted to focus on this year is um, transitioning our budget as much as possible to more ongoing funding instead of this reliance on one-time funding. Um, there's um, sort of accounting and cash flow reasons why the reliance on one-time funding is, um, it, uh, why that's been used in the past. Um, but we know from running stable homes, stable schools, from uh, a lot of our other housing programs, that it's really hard um, to plan for next year and projects down the pipeline if you don't have a good sense about consistency of funding. And I know that's something a lot of the housing advocates have been asking us for for a long time is make this funding ongoing. Um, and so we really, not just in housing, but in general across the enterprise, tried to take a really hard look at if things are working and they are not in fact pilot programs anymore um, we should commit to making them ongoing and so a lot of the changes you'll see throughout the budget um, that are additions in this difficult year are with that in mind that this was important work that the city was engaging in and we wanted to make sure that there was consistency over time um, so that's just sort of like a big picture um, structural change that you'll see throughout the budget and i did put in the chat um they we have a um a budget 
basics and summary document that I don't have at my fingertips right now, but I will can get to Katie to circulate to the group that um, has some more details on the rest of the budget beyond um, the great presentation that roasted on the housing pieces, just so you can get kind of a sense about where the other um, departments and cuts and um, spending sort of have um, have landed in the mayor's proposal. Right. And this is right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just one. Yeah, because we have um, we've had several meetings and I know that the budget, I know we're in a real challenging time as it relates with budgets and cuts and things that are being lost because of COVID-19. But we as a committee, we, we haven't really presented any affordable housing opportunities I, that I know of in our discussions. The budget basically is talking about Minneapolis homes. Now that's going to be and Minneapolis home. Our existing funding base funding ideals that are there in Minneapolis homes just did a total revamp in the way that's being structured and its RFP uh, for some of the city lots. Um, but we as a committee haven't really presented any affordable housing ideals on in this area or anything about addressing uh, disparity gaps as it relates to housing as well. Uh, we've done a lot of discussion around uh, reno homelessness um, and tenant issues, but we really haven't tackled this as a, a very important. Um, these are important housing items that I, I'd like to see us in, you know, even moving into next year. It is on our proposed agenda for items we were going to address in 2020, but I don't recall us really presenting or having discussions around it. This is Mary, and I'd like to. Um, to say also that we have had no discussion of affordable home ownership and. Um, changing the disproportionate numbers of home ownership among minorities and and whites in our community and it's been a really big source of frustration for me in this community. you know um we haven't discussed affordable home ownership at all hi i have my hand up this is shanaya I just wanted to uh, provide comments about the budget regarding the NOAA preservation. I um, just want to say that I support that that's been an ongoing investment um, that's outlined in the budget. I think anything that we can do to maintain our naturally occurring affordable housing um, is great. Great. Thanks, Shania. And thanks for speaking up. I guess I can't always see. It's a share screen who's got their hand up. So I'm glad you just chimed in. Anyone else have more comments that you want to make on the budget? Um, this is Colleen O'Connor Toberman again. The the cuts to regulatory services and sort of, you know, in enforcement, especially kind of tenant initiated enforcement of livability issues is um concerning but again it's a little bit harder i think to be more detailed on a recommendation without kind of you know without knowing the rest of the budget knowing that is it is a difficult year and you know all sorts of important services are going to feel some pain this year potentially so so um joey do you care if i jump in and just talk a little bit about the reorg and how that might help yes yeah, so okay. Really okay so one of the things that was part of the budget uh, decision on the part of regulatory services. You may or may not know this, but we have fire inspections under one division and they do four plus units and housing inspection service under the housing inspection services, one through three units. As part of the budget, um, this year's budget, and part of a way to uh, mitigate some of the cost savings and improve efficiencies is we are now merging those two divisions. So we will now, as, assuming the council uh, passes the budget and, and approves sort of our layout, we'll be having the housing inspections and fire inspections under one uh, 
division. The working title is called Inspections Division. Um, and by doing that, we um, really sort of, uh, we're, we really are able to uh, be more agile in how we deliver staff resources towards um, higher priority rental property or rental situations. It allows us to be more sort of cohesive and aligned with our renter first initiatives and policies. And I think it will also help us um, meet the needs more uh, of our customers and rental housing um, with sort of the expanded and merged division. Um, and uh, that, and um, so we we are really conscientious of that, and um, and I know it was a hefty cut to rig services, but we're you know, renters are a super important part of our customers and our on our in our constitu in our stakeholder group, and so um, we will continue to do our best to provide that high service, um, and yes, there may be some. Um, delays because we have fewer st staff overall but we're going to have a more agile staff and a more uh, and a staff that can get to to more buildings i think more quickly with this sort of blended staff um and then we're also working on some really great work in virtual doing a virtual uh rental licensing inspections and putting together protocol for you know when we need to get inside and the virtual inspections are uh, as we've got them set up are uh, really engaging the renters in a way that we haven't before in terms of having them be the driver in the driver's seat on doing the virtual inspections i know this is a lot in just a short order um, also using checklists ahead of time that renters can have um, so they know what they should and shouldn't be seeing in their apartment unit so um, yeah, so those two pieces are also part of this whole uh, budget shift um, and not that there won't be pain points and that we, you know, because we are seeing a reduction in sort of staff overall because we're holding vacancies. Um, uh, we I, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, it won't be as, you know, drastic. So as a 6% cut sometimes feels like it might be. I know that was a lot of words, sorry. That was informative, thanks. Just following up on that, Colleen, then is there any kind of with that information, is there anything that you would want to, um, you know, propose including in a comment on the budget with regard to rec services and inspections? Um, I, maybe not specific, knowing that there's mm -hmm. these other changes that, you know, might, I don't know, might just yield a different and improved tenant experience anyway. So it, it's hard for me to say unless someone else has a suggestion. Um, I mean, I don't think it's uh, bad to say that you want to make sure that the regulatory services cuts don't impact the renter experience, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I'm yeah. not, I think that's, and and I want you to hear that we hear that, you know, and that's a really, that's a priority for us as a as a as a division as a department of reg services so i think it never hurts to have it reinforced um for sure that sounds like a good comment thanks kelly great um sorry i have my i've got kids that are just back in and the other room and making a lot of noise so i keep muting myself and then i have to find my unmute to get back on so sorry for apologies for the delay um all right uh any other feedback for the city that you think would be important to include in the annual report separate from budget comments And again, I'm not seeing any hands. So if you do have something, feel free to just say it. I do. I'm sorry. Um, this is uh, Karina. Uh, Kelly, Hi. thank you. For, yes. yes, Kelly, thank you for that. I was um, looking at this budget and kind of worried about the regulatory problem um, because, you know, I have a lot of issues <laughs> with our building. Uh, so I think that keeping that money there. Um, is important uh, for those problematic buildings that uh, have issues um, with um, 
with mold and all of that stuff. Um, I was on a call today with with a HUD conference call today, and um, it sounds like HUD is looking to have tenants start uh, tagging along with a REAC inspection. It's not a definite thing, but um, those inspections are important. Um, so in the work for the regulatory, having that money, uh, making sure that families are, you know, living in healthy, safe homes is important. So um, I would like to see, you know, the regulatory services get more funding so that they can continue that good work and making sure our houses are healthy and all that good stuff. Great. Um, all right, so Joey is capturing all these comments. Um, I know we are almost at time, so I'll just give kind of one more chance to for anyone who wants to raise an issue or comment or feedback to ensure that we to ensure that we get that into the annual report, anything that's separate from the budget. I see a hand up, but I can't tell whose it is. If your hand is up, go ahead and talk. Oh, it's Cecil. Okay. Um. So when we did our planning process, and I think it was at the start of this year, because it seems like it's hard to remember anything outside 2020. Um, but the we did have as a priority the discussion about SROs, um, and that is a an option for the council to examine and look at. And I think we should just. Um, find a way of commenting that that uh, we're pleased that there's been some response from council on that and that was an, an interest or a priority interest of this group at the start of the year and um, we're encouraged by the reports that are coming forth of um, serious policy discussions. And it's just to link our work to their work. Right. Yeah, it feels like there are places where there's 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 getting to be some synergy between the the policy recommendations they're making and getting feedback from this committee, which feels like a good use of our time, I think. So. And this is Katie. I wonder if similarly we might want to highlight um, what David and Mary were raising. Mm -hmm about the the fact that this committee did identify the you know racial disparities in home ownership and and the need for more affordable home ownership options um and maybe it's just i'm not sure what the way to phrase it um because you're right we haven't spent much time on that as a committee um this year but maybe it's just just saying that it is a priority for the committee um i i, I anyway i don't be open or whatever suggestions others may have, but just wanting to to make sure that we're naming that. Like an area of work that we haven't spent a lot of time on, but we really would see that as, um, but it was listed as a priority and something we want to continue focusing on yet this year and into 2021. Yeah, and I will just say, you know, I think David mentioned the, um, the changes to Minneapolis homes that um, I think that was probably maybe a bit of a, a missed opportunity for us to spend more time on that. You know, I think Roxanne Kimball was did a brief presentation on some of the ideas late last year, and then that work was uh, you know adopted by the council this summer. And so, you know, I think it's partly partly um, you know we didn't quite get time out make time for it on the agenda partly we missed a bunch of meetings you know there's all sorts of reasons but i think it was maybe a missed opportunity for us to have this committee to have had more of a voice on that work um and so although it's already been adopted by council it, it may be something for us to consider in one of our upcoming meetings just at least hearing about um about what the changes are and what the hope is for the outcomes um so that the committee is aware of that and then maybe it's more of a like um the the work for the committee but could be tracking whether what we're hoping to have happen with those program changes actually happens um 
just a one thought anyway. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, this is Joey. Just briefly, I think in one of our leadership um, kind of planning discussions, we did, um, looking back at my notes, have a sort of a plan in November to talk about homeownership, specifically stabilizing current homeowners. But I think, you know, it's sounding like a good time to dedicate some time to that, maybe at our, our November meeting. Um, so if anyone has specific angles they want to address, um, let us know. Otherwise, maybe we, staff and the coaches and leadership will talk about, you know, what might make sense for our November meeting. And then I guess I'd also just suggest um, in terms of the budget. So if, you know, obviously Rose showed the schedule. Um, so I guess both the budget and then for the annual report, um, I think the a thought today was to kind of gather the feedback and start to form it into something that then the, the committee could potentially approve as a next step in November. Is that right, Colleen and Joey? I'm just trying to make sure we're not needing to kind of like vote on something today. I think the idea was to brainstorm and come back in November to. Yeah, that's I don't think my, yeah. yeah, I think I'd agree with exactly that. I think you put it well. OK. All right. Well, I think we can probably call it a successful meeting and start wrapping up. I think does that does, uh, Joey, do you feel like you've gotten the chance to capture everything that we talked about? Thank yeah, I think so. Have. Yeah, thanks everybody for your comments. I think between now and the November meeting, um, maybe you know, with Rose, your help, we can put together some drafts, some proposed comments um, for the budget and then maybe a revised report to the committee that we can spend a little time looking at at our November meeting and, and formally adopt. So if there anything that has come to mind that comes to mind between like in the next few weeks, please email us or, or reach out. If you take a look back at Rose's presentation, I thought her questions were helpful. If it's either things we want to support or things that we're disappointed in, or even questions that we have or things we want to be on the council's mind, um, send those to one or all of us in the coming weeks and we'll get something together for the November meeting to um, consider adopting as a committee. And I'll send out the budget piece that Andre Andrea was talking about um, that hopefully will help um, for the questions Colleen raised about the bigger context. Um, so that might also help just form your thinking for November as well. So we'll make sure that gets out too. Great. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second, this is, this is Scott. <laughs> All right. I don't think we have to do a roll call on that. <laughs> All right. Is, I think we can just. All in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Have a good Thank evening, everyone. Voice vote. All yeah. right. Hey, Kelly, Thanks, can everyone. You, uh, yeah, Kelly, give me a call. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>